No, lay down, yeah. lay down, lay down, yeah. <laughs> lay down. <laughs> we do it. Why don't you become your safety? Ready? All right, all right. We had to, we had to bring in medical safety here. Ben apparently is frozen. You want to give him CPR? Mouth to mouth. I, I, I could do it. I could do it. Like, do you pump first, or what do we do? Uh, I think you blow, and then I pump, and then you. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on. <laughs> I was not. <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I was planning on blocking it with my hand. We are here in Pittsfield with the team for SpartanUpPodcast.com. We've got Colonel Nye on my left. We're going to change his position pretty soon. He'll be on the right at some point here for a better profile picture. In the military, the person great. on the left is always a subordinate. Oh. All right, we're going to move you to the right. That's the person on the right. <laughs> we've, yeah, got, like we're <laughs> <laughs> we've, got, we've got medicine woman Sephra. Yeah. Right. We, and which we're going to change your name pretty soon. We're going to call you like wilderness expert. And then we've got Johnny, the doctor from from Canada, uh, interviewed Ben Greenfield. You guys saw the open. Yeah. You know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, was quite, it was quite an open. Quite romantic. Quite an open. Um, are, 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 are they all going to be that impactful? Like, that, was, that was some some drama. That I got to cool. kiss Ben. I know the story. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little weird. Fairy tale. I, I like to think you saved Ben's life is why I saw it. But. He was turning blue. He was in my pool. It was 40 degrees. It was freezing. Um, I wanted to perform CPR, closed my eyes, didn't really want my lips to touch his, and um, unless there was some kind of Freudian slip or something going on, <laughs> you'd be able to comment on. And uh, they hit, I leapt backwards, and uh, what happens in Pittsfield stays in Pittsfield. Sure, sure, <laughs> we're, sure. we're, not, we're not talking about it. But, um, but we awesome are going to talk about. We are going to talk about um, amazing guy, super knowledgeable, wrote, wrote the book Beyond Training, and we really dive into uh, some of his techniques. He's He's done uh, sub 10 hour Ironman on very little training. He was a bodybuilder, uh, stays extremely fit. He's like the ultimate bio hacker, he calls himself. Yeah. And, so, and, and quite a family man as well, is that correct? Yeah, he's, he's got, got a great family. Yeah, he's got yeah. a great family, right? Great family, the kids are so cute. They came up and uh, visited Pooties, the, the 10 camp on the mountain, and just the cutest kids, and everyone's smiling and laughing, wife, they all love each other. He's really figured out, you know, I love to learn what, what he does, how, how he's, so fit and has such a wonderful that's I'm family. For, that's something I'm looking for with, with these uh, interviews is to see how these really successful people balance that. Yeah. Because, you know, there are people who are really, really talented, but they blow their family completely yeah. up. Yeah, or by themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, when you say he's a guy who has all this balance, I'm looking forward to hearing how he managed to have that huge level of success and the great family and great the family. fitness and everything yeah. else. Any, anybody can focus when there is no distraction. Sure, yeah. yeah. I can tell you, it, it, it's, hey, more than his, gone. it's more than his lips. <laughs> it's, not just, it's not just that wonderful house. It's not just the lips. Okay, cool. All right, All right cool. Check this it. out. I'm rolling. Dude, it is 40 degrees out. That water is ice cold. You're crazy. Starting. All right, we are here at Spartan Up the Podcast. Ben Greenfield, author of Beyond Training, insisted on sitting in the pool in Vermont. It is a um, pretty cold day. It's uh, 40 degrees or maybe even less. You've been in for 40 minutes. Yeah, what working on my tan. <laughs> what do you, t you typically sit in, a, in, a, in cold water for how long every day? Uh, typically, I take a cold shower in the morning for about five minutes, and then in the evening for about five minutes. Uh, but when I'm in Vermont and there's a pool, and I can see my breath, I figured, what the heck? I want to go jump in Joe's pool. <laughs> you know, you're starting to slur your words. I know, seriously. <laughs> I need, a, I need a hot cup of coffee. You were an Ironman. That was your first big um, endurance event, Ironman? Well, I was, a, I was a collegiate tennis player and a bodybuilder and got into endurance sports after I met my girlfriend, who's now my wife. Uh, she was a runner and started running with her. She, uh, she actually introduced me to triathlon. Speaking of cold water, I remember that one of the first things I did with her was she brought me up to a triathlon and she smeared her body in Crisco she didn't have a wetsuit and then she uh she went swimming in the cold water and i was on her team and i was the i was the runner for her team and uh i ran in that triathlon and from that point on i was hooked in triathlon 
Nice. So. How cold was that water, would you guess, that you'd put Crisco all over that your was, That was Lake Coeur d'Alene, so that was probably about 50 degrees. Ooh, that's cold. Yeah. That's cold. This is a little yeah. colder. It could be. Do you have any Crisco? <laughs> I don't have any Crisco. <laughs> so, um, so from there, you did Hawaii Ironman. Well, I did, uh, yeah, I did uh, Ironman Coeur d'Alene, yeah. and I uh, had no clue what I was doing, but uh, qualified for Ironman Hawaii, and got hooked, raced for the next uh, eight years in Ironman. Doing Ironman. So. And you just stumbled upon, this is going to sound self-serving, but you just stumbled upon Spartan Race, and I heard rumors of um, you uh, getting pretty passionate about Spartan. Yeah, yeah, I'm really digging it. I, I got into Spartan back in... Uh, November, December, did a race in California, and uh, it was a, a super Spartan, and I liked it so much, I came back the next day and raced a sprint, and uh, been racing one about every month since then. Typically, a triathlete, Ironman, um, wouldn't make that jump, that leap over to Spartan. It's just too dirty, too gritty. Um, you guys are used to $5,000 bikes, perfect goggles, everything's got to be pristine. Um, do you think you're rare, or do you think... Um, a bunch of triathletes could move over. No, I, I think you're right. I think triathletes are, are a very clean, pristine, precise group of individuals. And, uh, you know, for me, one of the things is that, and, and this is, you know, what the, what the Navy SEALs say, and I know you've talked to Mark Devine before, uh, they say that, that being strong makes you harder to kill. And I think that, uh, that the whole triathlete, uh, the, you know, the, the body that kind of makes you look like you get sand kicked on your face at the beach and the, you know, being skinny and the loss of muscle and all the things that kind of go along with that. I hope you're not sitting still while you listen. If you are, you better get a burpee break in. We are inside now. We saved Ben Greenfield's life. He took um, the cold water a little too seriously this morning. It was 40 minutes? It was about 45 minutes. What, yeah. What, yeah, where do you go too far? Like, uh, like what's too much? I think, and actually, uh, I did the, uh, the, the Navy SEAL camp uh, in Encinitas, and what they did there was they'd take us out of the ocean and have us raise our hands above our head. And once you couldn't bring your hands above your head, that would indicate that you were too hypothermic to, for your muscles to function. So, right now I'm about here. <laughs> we saved them, so we're can you to say. Can say what that is? For... Say what, so, what is. Oh, I, I can get my hands up to about shoulder height. Yeah, all oh, right, for the um, audio portion. So, yeah. um, so, but let's just talk about what's too far in life. Like here we are, push, 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 right? That's the whole idea behind Spartan Up the Podcast. Let's go further. Let's eat healthier. Let's go beyond our limits. What's too much? You know, I think too much is when you start to forget the, the important things in life. Like the, the reason that I go out and I do hard things, like, you know, do a Spartan or do a triathlon or, or anything else is a very, very big part of it is... I want to raise uh, amazing human beings who are going to grow up to make this world a better place. I want to inspire my kids, and for me to do that, I have to be the strongest version of me. Um, I think that once your activities begin to take you away from what's important, and for me that's, that's family, friends, love, relationships, I think that's where it starts to get a little excessive. But if you can somehow merge have it all work together, you know, activity with yeah. relationships and family, I think that's the perfect life. So, and what you do is you just bring your family to the races. I bring my family to the races. I train with my family. Um, you know, I talked about this a little bit yesterday in the 431 Project about how, you know, a lot of, a lot of athletes have this concept that they want to be the invisible exerciser. They want to have all of their, their activity done before the kids get up in the morning or after the family goes to bed at night. My wife and I are the complete opposite. You know, we'll, we'll put our kids in our back and do hill sprints and, you know, take our kids in the pool with us. Um, you know, we're, we're the double jog, jogging stroller and the double bike, you know, trailer. We, we love to take our kids out with us. So, so they see it and they live it and feel it. They see it, they live it. They've done studies that show that when kids see their parents being fit and physically active, the kids are automatically more fit and physically active. So just the just the learning by osmosis is really. No, that important. makes that makes perfect sense, right? Because that becomes normal for the kid. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you were touching chromosomes earlier. What was the story there? 
Uh, so the idea is that there are, there are certain activities that are anti-aging activities. Um, interestingly, endurance is not really one of them. Hmm. Um, two that, that come to mind is one is lifting heavy stuff. So if you put your body under load, it actually sends a message to your body that, that decreases the rate at which your telomeres shorten and that it has an anti-aging effect. Standing is another one. They just did a study a couple of years ago that showed that the longer you stand during the day, that's a direct effect on, on, aging. Your, on your aging. Yeah, so these, you know, these standing workstations are not sitting all the time. So standing with your computer over your head holding yeah. some weight would be... That, that'd probably be perfect. Actually, and, and I, I do this at home, I wear a weighted vest, so you can get these you know, 20 to 50 pound weighted vests, and then I have something called a rebel desk, which is a hand crank desk that goes up and down. Oh, nice. So I can stand at my desk wearing a weighted vest, you know, writing an article or, or whatever. And I like that. I'll stay a baby forever. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and, it, and that's handy for next time you're in the pool and I have to do mouth to mouth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, what's your favorite exercise? Favorite exercise. So I, I've got this hike that I do with my kids. Uh, it's in Sakani Park back in Spokane. Um, and I do that weighted vest, and then I put on one of these elevation training masks, which is, it, it's a restricted airflow mask, so it makes you feel like you're breathing through a straw. And then I take my kids on a hike, so I can hang out with my kids while I'm sucking air and dragging a weight up, a, up the side of a hill. I feel like I get a workout, they get to hang out with me, and that's a pretty, pretty epic way to train. So do you think, like, we were going back to the kids seeing stuff, so they see you in a with a weighted vest and a gas mask on, you don't think that's a little strange? It's a little strange, but strange is good. But it's you working know, it's, out so uh, far. Yeah, yeah, it's working out. So I, I think I think it's okay to be unique, and uh, we get some strange looks on the trail when when people see Bane from Batman carrying two little twin boys up the side of a mountain, but. Uh, it keeps life interesting. So one last one. Uh, what would you say to people out there that have a tough time getting motivated, tough time getting out of bed? How do you, how do you suggest they do it? Is there any special? You, you always come up with these concoctions, bone broth. Uh, you, you just... Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's all sorts of ways you you can you can biohack and and supplement and you know engage in better living through science and whatnot. But the number one most important thing you can do is. Uh, you know, put your money where your mouth is, put pen to paper, and sign up for something, whether it's a, a 5K or a weight loss competition or a triathlon or a Spartan race or whatever. If you have something on the calendar, you get it done. You know, and I'm the same way. If I don't have something on the calendar that I'm training for, you know, it's not going to get done. So, All right, you heard it. Sign up for something, anything. I love that concept. Don't be an invisible exerciser. Involve your kids in what you're doing. So instead of hiding that workout, just get them outside with you, you know? I mean, that's what you do, Joe, right? Your kids are always working out with you. I used to wake up super early um, and then try to get it done so that I could hang out with the family later, but then um, I'm such an addict that I would work out with them also. So uh -huh. so I, I got the best of both worlds. Got to do it alone and with the kids. And you're right, it's becoming like brushing their teeth. The kids just mm -hmm. wanna work out now because they think that's what every human being should do. And they, yeah. can, they can run like a bear about as fast as I can run. So <laughs> something's working. Yeah, but it, but it builds, builds a lot of confidence in the kids. I know I used to take my kids to the gym with me and I would lift and I would specifically bench and I'd always get my son or daughter. You used to bench? A, a few times. <laughs> um, and they would spot me and grown men, adults would come over and say, hey, I'll get that. And I'd say, no, my son can get this. Yeah. And it was a weight I knew I could get, but I would struggle so that he knew he could do it. Yeah. And then it, it, it was actually him gaining the confidence. That's you know, so it, it really helps them in the long run. Yeah, it is a confidence booster, I agree. There's lots that we'll take away from this interview, so I don't want to stay on this too long, but the thing with having the kids watch your exercise, if you're fitting your exercise in and saying to the kids, hey, I got it done before you got up, what they learn in life is that you have to find time to fit this stuff in and it becomes a chore as opposed to it just being part of your life. And I know it is with your kids and you know they showed with them. That's phenomenal for those kids that it doesn't become a how do I fit exercise in, which is a real mind trap that people get stuck in it just is part of their life so this is just what great. we do yeah yeah and uh, i think i think another great takeaway is that idea of like the rebel desk my brother at brooklyn boulders has the active collaborative workspace where physicality stimulates innovation and creativity right so if you can find any way to 
have movement, be standing up, you know, exercising while you're working. I think it just helps keeps all those gears going. There's a reason we're not sitting around in comfy chairs right now. Yeah, exactly. That's right, standing yeah, up on a cold going, room. Yeah. Cold burn. <laughs> <laughs> cold. Freezing. Although, speaking of cold, we're not as cold yeah. as he was in that interview. Yeah. He was wow. freezing. Was I, made him, I made him sit. I had to be an hour, 45 minutes, an hour in the pool. That's incredible. And he... he um, That's a long time. Yeah, he's, he got completely stiff. He couldn't move. Yeah. That pool's but, cold on a hot, sunny day. On a hot so. day. But, you yeah. know, it's interesting, though, because, um, you know, he, the willingness to dive in and be uncomfortable. We spend all of our lives, we teach people to try and make everything comfortable, everything easy. And obviously that's not what you're about. It's not about making it easy, right? So I, I think you're attracted to these people who are willing to, to make life harder sometimes. Yeah, but the, what you were talking about, getting comfortable, the, the water plays a trick. You get in the water, yeah. if the water is warmer than the air, yeah. then you're warmer in the water. Yeah. Problem is your body is losing heat at like 10 times yeah. the rate yeah. that it does in the air. So you think you're warming up and you're actually freezing. We've had uh, uh, young ranger students die in ranger school yeah. from hypothermia because it's cold out. They get in the water, yeah. they stay there, they thinking they're warming up, and, yeah. and they they're Do they not. have Crisco on? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not, not to make fun of the ranger. <laughs> you know, not necessarily <laughs> applying to Ben Greenfield. Question for, for the team here. Mm -hmm. um, I like to make people uncomfortable. I like to make life uncomfortable. We invite people up to Pittsfield. We throw Ben in an ice-cold mm -hmm. pool. There are many people that then uh, start to hate me sure and and i'm starting to wonder <laughs> i saw um, an email from one yesterday <laughs> yeah because because um we talked about that yesterday yeah. we got an email from this kid zach who oh, begged yeah. he begged oh, yeah, he begged for months to come up here he wanted to be part of it i begged Last him not to come weeks. i said go to school he had a full ride at a college in florida came up here we put him to the test he lasted i don't know 30 days 45 days okay. jumped in a bus left we paid for his food we put him up he's angry yeah. at us or is he? It was funny. Yeah, I had a similar we'll experience doctor. We're, we're building uh, the wall in, in the river, right? So these are people who've been going for 48 hours. They're exhausted. They've just made a terrible choice. They see everyone else getting this comfy bus and they find out they're going off to some cushy thing. And uh, these guys are in the river working for another full day. This is in the death race this summer. Zach ended up in that group. And I'm just doing what I'm doing. I'm just having them pile up rocks. The people who were able to transcend this and make it a positive thing got that as awful as this situation is, they're doing something cool. They're building, it's actually one of the easiest things to do in the death race when you actually have a, a goal building this thing. Zach decided he wanted to pick a fist fight, so fist fight with me, <laughs> demonstrating both uh, poor character and very poor judgment, I would suggest. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, I uh, was not as tired and was able to <laughs> diffuse the situation. But you're right, the, the idea that, um, that people will take a situation that they've chosen to be in and then they'll blame the person, you know, uh, when somebody, what was the one a while ago where somebody quit because it was just the race had become stupid in their mind, it had become too hard. Yeah. So it's like you want to sign up for the hardest race in the world so you can tell your friends you're doing the hardest race in the world, but it's too hard. So, but back back to Ben and the idea that um, you know, he talks about choosing difficult things, right? And and they go out and they do these these uh, these challenging exercises, and then translates back into their life. So when when you were were talking with Ben and and. Um, what were the things that, that you saw as being most applicable to other people? And I, I know you asked that a lot in, in the interviews, you know, what, what's the takeaway for a normal person? Yeah, what's so, the so for I, person? I, think, I think it's just um, taking that first step. Like, uh, I think there's probably a lot of people that look at Ben Greenfield and his family and say they're abnormal, right? They're cooking bone broth. He's out carrying rocks over his head as he walks up the mountain. The kids are walking with no shoes. He's diving in cold pools, but sounds like it, my kind of normal. Yeah, <laughs> is it is it really abnormal? No, or I think right? now now it is. Yeah. But I think I mean it is abnormal. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, not, it is I think, it is not the norm of today's society. It just isn't. Yeah. Past couple hundred but maybe years, we, but maybe right? we have to accept abnormal. Maybe abnormal uh, has to become normal. I, I all, didn't say it was wrong. Yeah, all progress but, yeah, de yeah. depends on the unreasonable man, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I once, I, 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 Marion's telling us we got to go, but one more turn on this. I once read this article, I wish I could find it, on um, abstract art and how ridiculous um, it, and how far, let's call it far right, art can go. And the argument the, the author was making was you have to push art that far in order to get a little movement in normal art. Sure, right. And so, right. And so that's what we're talking about here, right? Yeah, if yeah. you, you want to be the leader of a movement, you have to be out front. So you're abnormal because you're not part of the norm. You're pushing it. Yeah. You're the guy pushing the pack. And yeah. you so go I think just by definition, he is. pointillism, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right, so let's, um, let's lead and let's push and let's get. Find the chinks of people's armor, make it more resilient, yeah. There so, you go. So if, if people want to find out more about these podcasts, where do they go, Joe? I'm going to lead you on this one. Sp I, you can keep doing that. <laughs> SpartanUpPodcast.com. They'll learn more. They'll read. They'll see the show notes. And they will become different people. Interactive.
interactive, right? They can send us their thoughts as well. Oh, right? they can send us yeah. thoughts. Yeah, you, you'll um, you'll read, and in some cases, you might even show up at their house. <laughs> in, the night, in the night in the special night, operator yeah, yeah, yeah. for more information go to spartanuppodcast.com and that's where you'll see the show notes you'll learn uh, stuff that we didn't talk about here I don't know what you'll do there but it'll be fun <laughs> I'm sure <laughs>